Let us bow our heads for a word of prayer. Lord, it has been good to have this time of fellowship with these sainted people at this marvelous temple called the Angelus Temple. And I pray, Heavenly Father, that because of us having to leave tonight, may this heavenly atmosphere that's here now ever remain. We thank Thee for these nights of real fellowship around Thy Word and with Thy people, and for the lost souls that's been brought in to God's great fold. And for the straying ones that's been brought back and renewed their fellowship with Thee. Lord, we would not forget those who have been afflicted and sick. For there has been many of those, Lord, according to their testimonies and their letters, that were in dying conditions and sitting in wheelchairs and on stretchers that's up healthy and happy tonight because of thy presence. And it's all been because of thee, O Lord. And we pray that you'll bless us as we travel on. Bless these services that's coming up. The pastor of this church, our brother McPherson and his wife and all the associate pastors and we would pray for Billy Adams that it has the healing service here. Lord, answer that boy's prayer to everyone that comes needy. And to all the ministers that's cooperated and we just thank thee for all these things. And we shall never forget it in our hearts. And we pray, Father, that you'll Grant that some day when we are finished on the earth, may we all gather around your great table in glory for that wedding supper that you've promised us, Lord. And when the battle is won, as you come out in the farm of Melchizedek to meet Abraham and give him the communion, when our battle is over, Lord, we're going to look for you to be standing there at the table. We shall drink with thee the, the fruit of the vine again anew in the kingdom of God. Until then, Lord, may we labor, work, and pray, watching for his coming. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. It would be hard for me if I was a speaker to find words to express my feelings, gratitude, and thankfulness to this great church, all you people. And for these about 16 days, I believe, of services here in the Angelus Temple, I've just had the privilege of speaking again to brother and sister McPherson. And I was telling him of the great uh, work that he is doing, trying to hold on and keep the work that his sainted mother uh, left here behind. And this has been the red letter days for us. We shall never forget this meeting. The cooperation, the lovely spirit, and we have seldom run into groups of people who were so cooperative and trying to work everything to make us welcome as this group at the Angelus Temple has did. It's been a wonderful meeting. And we've had a great fellowship together around the Word. And the Holy Spirit as did for us the exceedingly abundantly above all that we could or think. We are so happy for this. And I'm expressing for the boys too, Leo and Jean, 
They want to thank you for the books that you bought, the tapes, the records. And I want to thank you from the depths of my heart for the love offerings, the missionary offering. I shall do my very best to use it to the kingdom of God the best that I know how. I have been preaching 30 years now, and myself, I never took an offering in my life. My wife is sitting present, her and the children, and I just want to tell this, she'll kind of rake me over the coals of that. <laughs> you can imagine that, anyone that knows her, she's so bashful, I said, I wish you'd walk up to the platform this minute. She said, you want me to faint? <laughs> and she's very, very <laughs> timid about it. And, um, so we are very thankful to you all for your goodness and kindness. One day when I was pastoring the little Baptist tabernacle there in Jeffersonville, the, it wasn't because the people wouldn't give me an offering. I just was young and able to work, so I just worked and didn't have to take an offering. I pastored there 17 years and never took one cent. And the closest I ever come of taking an offering myself was, well, one time was for the Four Square Church, a missionary rally. I made a talk. And that was for Brother Beard over at Kansas City. I made a missionary talk and told him because my heart is in missions. And every night, uh, I feel inspired as I look around here and see these different nations represent. That's, uh, that's missionaries out of this temple in other countries. You'll never go wrong being a missionary. That's the general orders all the world to every creature. We got in a tight place where we couldn't make ends meet. I'm sure we're all here in the visible audience know about those things. And I said to the wife, I was working, walking high lines then for the public service. Had walked 30 miles a day through the jungles and was gone about. I got home once or twice a week. And this was on Wednesday night and I had to rush in ragged, pulling through the brush and stuff. And wife had my clothes laying out on the bed and... We had two rooms, and I was, had run across to the church. And so I told her, I said, Honey, you know what? Tonight I'm going to take up an offering. I need $5. And we just can't make those ends meet, and I'm going to ask for an offering. So I got up that night, and I said, Friends, I said, I, we never took an offering in this tabernacle, but I kind of hit a little snag. I said, I, We're going to... Pass a hat. My hat was hanging on the side of the wall. I said, we're going to take a little offering, nickel, 10 cents, something you have to throw in and be just fine. Old Uncle Jim Wiseheart, he's in glory tonight, an old deacon. He goes over to get my hat. There's a little woman by the name of Weber. She used to sit right down before me. She prayed all the time. Little old-fashioned mother. She wore one of these little aprons that has a pocket on the inside. Did you ever see one of those? They, they put the pocket inside the apron. And she reaches down in there and is doing a time of hard times, pulled out one of those little pocketbooks that snaps on the top, began pulling out those nickels. Uh, I couldn't do that. I looked at that and I, I just felt my heart swell up. Oh, I said, I was just teasing you. I didn't mean it. <laughs> and... Uh, <laughs> and I couldn't have spent that if I'd had to. And however, how I come to get out of that little tight place, old brother Ryan from Benton Harbor, uh, many of you might have known him. He's out here in California with me one time, long beard. He rode an old bicycle down there and it kind of backslid on him and he gave it to me. And I went out to the 10 cent store and got me two cans of paint and painted up and sold it and didn't have to take up offering after all. That was the closest I ever come of taking an offering. Well, I, I would like to make this statement. I wish the radio audience could see this fine group of people here tonight. Just sure a wonderful crowd here in the temple tonight. And 
I love you with godly love. And if any time that I can be a favor to you, let me know. And I'm always, when I'm home, I'm praying for the sick and the afflicted by phone and sending prayer claws and so forth. I'll be glad to help you in any way I can. Now, there may be, if I'd ask tonight how many Methodist, Baptist, Presbyterian, they'd be all across here. There's no denominational barriers among us. We just reach across the fence to everybody because we're all one in Christ Jesus. All one. So... If the Lord willing, I'm to be back in your lovely city in a, about three or four weeks. If I go overseas to Australia, I'm to be there on the 15th, so I'll probably pass through here about the 10th. And on my road to Australia, New Zealand, and the east. And if it's set up a little bit as a Christian businessman, Brother Sakarian and them, for the convention, I'll be here then. I think it's along the last of June. Instead of the 15th to be the last for the Christian Businessmen's Convention. We are uh, anticipating on attending that if they can lengthen the meetings out. Or it depends on when Brother Billy Graham leaves Australia. Well, I wouldn't want to be there the same time he was because it's not Christian-like. It's not even gentleman-like, let alone Christian. And so um, if he's going to stay up into June... Up into June, then I may attend the convention here. They've so graciously given me an invitation to speak for them in the convention. It's on a Thursday night is my night. Wednesday night's Brother Roberts, and Thursday night is my night. And I want to be for the complete convention because there's some noted speakers to be here. God bless you all. It's my prayer. And out in Radio Land, it's been a privilege to speak to you through the medium of this radio. And I was hearing coming over, I believe this afternoon, that someone who sponsored this part of the meeting paid this money in that they could get by this radio time for me to, to um, speak over the air. God bless your gallant soul. I, I certainly appreciate that and I trust that, it, that God will richly pay it back to you, brother, sister, a hundredfold. I hope that the Holy Spirit can express it. I, I'm temperamental, and I, I kind of got all tore up here this afternoon. I, I believe I just better keep still for a little bit. So the Lord bless you. I hope he'll let you know just how I feel, every one of you. God bless you. I hear that Brother Duffield is feeling ill tonight. It's called a, a bad cold. If he's listening in, God bless you, Brother Duffield. And heal your sick body. May God grant that to you. Now, for the closing text, just for a short time, I don't mean to keep you long because tomorrow's Monday and you have to go to work. So I want you to turn to, if you have your Bibles, to St. John, the 14th chapter. And while you're turning, this is a rather an unusual text. But you know, God is unusual. He does things in an unusual way. The 14th chapter and the 7th and 8th verse. And if you had known me, you should have known my Father also. And from henceforth you know him and have seen him. Philip saith unto him, Lord, Show us the Father, and it will satisfy us. Suffice is the word, which means satisfy. You might say, Brother Branham, that's just a very little text for a group of people this size and your radio audience of thousands. But you see, it isn't... There's been enough scripture read to convert the whole world. It isn't how much it is, it's what it is that counts. It's the word of God that has been read. And heavens and earth will pass away, but God's word shall not pass away. 
And I would like to take this tonight on show us the Father, and it will satisfy us. And I would like to take four ways that we can see God and prove that God is right here in this building. God in his universe and God in his word, God in his son and God in his people. I wish to take those four uh, places to try to show you that this aged old cry, who is God? Where is God? Could I see God? It's been the cry through the ages. Even Job, the most perfect man in his day, he wanted to know if he could find where he was. Maybe to go up to his door, knock at the door. If he could only see him. Everyone who is born on this earth has got a soul. Always are trying to look behind the curtain to see where they come from. What they are. And where they're going. There's been many great books written. But there's only one book in all the world that tells you where you come from, what you are, and where you're going. That's God's Word, the Bible. And every little text in the Bible will never perish because it's God's Word. You can hang your soul on any phase of God's Word. Any scripture, any verse are just one word. And sometimes one word changes a man's life. Some time ago in Canada, the late King George was making a trip, a tour through Canada and a very precious schools and so forth up there turned out to salute the king. And they give all the little children some flags, little British flags to wave at the king. And after the king had passed through the street, the school children was supposed to turn back to the school. And in one school, all the children come back but one, and it was a, a little bitty girl. While the, mo the mother and the teacher was frantic. They were running through the streets everywhere trying to find this little girl. And finally, standing by a telegraph pole with her little hands up like this, leaning against the pole, she was crying like her little heart would break. And the teacher ran to her and picked her up in her arms, and she said, Why are you crying, honey? Said, Did you not get to see the king? And she said, Yes, teacher, I saw the king. What well, said, did you not get to wave your flag at the king? She said, yes, I waved my flag at the king. And she said, well, why are you crying? She said, you see, I'm so little. I saw the king, but the king didn't see me. But it's not that way with Jesus. You can't do one little thing without him knowing it. He hears the faintest cry. He's in every little word that he spoke. And so the cry is, where is God? We'll speak first on him in his universe, nature. I wonder tonight how a man could look at the stars and go out here to Mount Palmer, Mount Wilson, or where that great observatory is, where they claim they can see about 120 million years of light space. I wonder how a man in his right mind could think of 120 million years of light space and those stars turning in their orbits, what holds them up there? 
How is it that they can time the eclipse of the moon and the sun for 20 years ahead so perfect that they don't miss a minute of the time? All the solar system works in perfect harmony with God. You wouldn't have to go very far to see God. In our city, there was a little boy who was in Sunday school and he asked his mother one day after displaying his stars of being so regular at Sunday school. He said to his mother, he said, Mama, if God is so great as they say he is, can anyone see him? And the mother said, well, Junior, I was your place. I would ask my Sunday school teacher. So he goes and asks the Sunday school teacher. And she says, Junior, I, I cannot explain that. Ask the pastor. So he goes to the pastor and he asked him. And the pastor said, why, Junior, certainly no one can see God said no one could ever see God. But somehow that didn't satisfy that little mind. And up the river from our places in the Ohio River is an island. It's called Six Mile Island. It's just six miles from Louisville to that island. The little boy used to go up there quite a bit with an old fisherman, gray-bearded, fine old Christian gentleman, one day when they'd been up the river, there'd come a storm. And they had to pull their boat to the bank. And after the storm was over, they launched out in the river again. And the sun was setting in the west. And after the storm, the old fisherman looked across the back of the boy to the east. And there was a rainbow. And he was pulling his boat as any uh, boatman knows the rhythm of that clipping of the waves against the oars as he was rowing with the current down the river. All the leaves washed off from the rain. Just seemed to be a quietness. And you know, nature works like that. If you're all flusterated and don't know what to do. Just come to Jesus. After the storm, there's a quietness, a peace that passes all understanding. And the old fisherman watching the rainbow, which with his back towards the bow of the boat, was looking at the rainbow, and he began weeping. And the little fellow sitting in the stern of the boat rushed up to the middle of the boat and fell down at the old fisherman's lap. And he said, Sir, I'm going to ask you something that my mother, neither my Sunday school teacher or pastor can satisfy my thinking. He said, If God is so great, can anyone see God? And the old fisherman, overcome with the little lad's statement, pulled him up in his arms hugged him up close, and he said, God bless your little heart, honey. All I've seen for the past 40 years has been God. He had so much God on the inside of him, he could see God on the outside. And if God is hid, he's hid to those that are blind to him. Because anyone can look around and see God. In the blooming of the flowers, how the little flower dies, the seed burst open, the pup runs out, and everything's gone. But then that flower lives again. That's God making a way for that flower to live again for service. If God has a way of making a flower live again, how about a man that's made in his image? And if you watch God in nature, when I go hunting in the fall of the year, when I can, way up in the north, and you watch those little ducks up there, born on the, the lake, and 
As soon as it starts getting cold, those little fellows will raise right straight up out of that lake and go just straight to Louisiana as they can go. No compass or nothing. What guides them? God. And did you ever notice when you go out in the winter time and see the rabbits bedding down close to the ground, getting back under the grass, and you turn on the radio, and the radio, the news commentator says, well, tomorrow is going to be pretty weather. Don't you pay no attention to that. That rabbit knows more about that than he ever will know. Yes, sir. Cause a something in him. God in nature. And you take, let the news commentator say, tomorrow it's going to be a pretty day. And watch that old sow take them shucks off of the, the north side of the hill and bring it around and make her bed on the south side of the hill. She knows more about the weather than that news commentator knows. Because that she is guided by instinct that God gave her. You can depend more on that than you can on anything that's mechanically made. Because it's God working in his great universe. A few years ago, I was up in Colorado hunting elk. It's something that I try to hunt each fall. Not so much to get the game, but to be out alone in the woods. That's where I found God was in the woods. My first prayer that I was going to pray to confess my sins, I didn't know how to do it. So I was going to write a letter to God and tack it on a tree in the woods so he could read it when he come down the path. For I knowed he was there. I remember the first herd of cattle I ever tried to drive out of the mountains. My feet felt like two big hunks of lead. I'd rolled off that horse and got my blanket and I thought I was a real cow hand. And I put my head in the saddle and there's an old guy there with us called Slim. And another fellow from Texas had a guitar and they were playing songs. And this fellow Slim had a comb with a piece of paper behind it, keeping up with him in tune. And the herd was all bedded down and after a bit they began to play down at the cross where my Savior died. It was down there for cleansing from sin, I cried. My heart began to jump. I took the blanket and pulled it over my head to keep from hearing it because I was a sinner. And after the cattle got quiet, I was laying there acting like I was snoring. But when I pulled the blanket down, I thought now it'll all be over because they've gone to bed and the watch is out there with the cattle. But when I looked up, them big stars was hanging just above me. Something said, who put them up there? And who's holding them in place? Just then the wind come through those whispering pines and it seemed like there was a voice that said, there's a land beyond the river that they call that sweet forever. And we only reach that shore by faith degree. I got my blanket and pulled it around my ears again. God's so great, he'll find you. I don't care where you are. Don't try to hide from him. You're fighting a losing battle. Just give up and you'll be happy. You can see him everywhere. I remember over on the Troublesome River, I was way high that year hunting elk. Mr. Jeffries, the rancher, we know the lands because we salted the cattle. It's about 35 miles, 40 from any kind of a ranch or anything, way up the top of the Continental Divide, just in behind Willow Creek. And we'd been, I've been in there for years helping with the cattle. I go back every time I can now to ride the roundup in the fall or take them up in the spring because I love it. Get out along, hear the whispering of the pines and to hear the, the birds holler and, and the rippling of the water. There's something about it that's godly. It speaks out. 
No man can stand in the woods, stand quiet for a few minutes, but what will know there's a God. And it hadn't snowed that year, so yet, and it was early in October, and, and the elk was still up high around Timberline. So Mr. Jeffrey said, Billy, you go on up here towards Corral Peaks, and I'm going back towards Haystack. I'll meet you day after tomorrow at the old shack back there where a homesteader went in years ago called the Wheatley Place. And I said, all right. We had our horses, so I tied my horse and went way high. And at that time of year, these usually, it'll storm a while, snow a while, and then the sun will come out. And I was walking along there and thinking about the Lord. And I love it just as the sun goes down. Or when it's coming up. And I was walking along this place looking for the elk, and it was come up a storm. And I got behind a tree, and oh, the wind just blew hard. Cold come behind it, and the evergreens begin to freeze. And after the storm was over, I was standing there thinking about the Lord and his goodness and his mercy. And I thought about when Elijah was in the den and and he heard the noise go by. And oh, I was just having a good time rejoicing in my heart. When the storm was over, I come out behind the tree. And I looked. And the elk herd had been scattered. And I, I heard a big male bugle on this side. And the mate answered down in the valley. No, but my mother's an Indian. And my conversion never took it out of me. I love nature. When I heard that bugle of that elk, listen over here, and the wolf got the howl and the coyote, and he's made answering in the bottom. You talk about the deep calling to the deep. I noticed then the sun setting back in the west, looking through the crevices like it was passing over California. That great eye peeping out looked like the eye of Jehovah, who runs to and fro all over the earth. There's no way to get away from him. I seen that. I raised up my hands and began to worship the Lord. And then the sun hitting that ice on the trees made a rainbow across the valley. And I said, that's right. There's God in the bugle of the elk. There's God in the call of the wolf. There's God in the sunset. There's God on the mountain, God in the valley. It's God all around. And I said, there he is in the rainbow. The rainbow is his covenant. And in the first chapter of Revelation, he was to look up on his jasper and starter stone, which is first and last. He that was, which is, and shall come. The jasper and starter stone was both... Benjamin and Reuben, the first and the last, the oldest and the youngest. And the covenant, God made a covenant that he would save man. And it just started bursting in my heart so much that I got real religious. I set my gun down against the tree and around and around that bush I went screaming to the top of my voice. I just had to let it out some way. I'd have blowed up. If somebody would have been in the woods, they'd thought they'd had an insane man up there. But I was rejoicing. I was right in the presence of the God of the universe. Everywhere around was God. You'll just look around. You'll see him. He's not hard to find. And if he's on the inside. And I was a shouting and screaming with my hands up now, you don't think Baptists shout but you should have been there then I'm a Pentecostal Baptist you know and so I run around this tree shouting and I stop with my hands up in the air and all at once a little pine squirrel just a blue coat policeman of the woods all noise and no squirrel and he's the noisiest little fellow there is in the woods the tattletale that warns all the game to run. And he jumped up on a stump there and looked over to me and started chatter, 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 chatter like he was going to tear me to pieces. Well, I stopped. I said, there's no need of getting excited, little fella. 
I'm just worshiping the Lord. The very God that made you, you should be doing the same thing. I said, if you felt like I did, you'd be doing the same thing. But I noticed the little fella in the amazement, he wasn't exactly uh, chattering at me. He'd cock his little head sideways and look down in a, some blow down there. Or the storms previously, not that storm, but another storm had blowed some trees down. Well, I thought, what's the little fellow so excited about? And I looked down there and the, it had forced the great eagle. A lot of big brown eagles up in there. It had forced this eagle. The winds had the storms down into this blowdown. And he was uh, chattering at that eagle. And oh, he jumping up and down like he's going to tear that eagle to pieces. And I thought, Lord, why did you distract my attention from your rainbow and from your great glory and your nature here? Why did you distract me from that? Why, it's good to be here. I could build three tabernacles like Peter said. But, of course, they sick waiting down at the bottom, you see. That's where I go just to rest a few days. And this big eagle jumped up on the limb. And I thought, now, God, you there's something that you want me to learn a lesson. Or you wouldn't have had this scene to take place. And I thought, now, the big eagle wasn't so worried about the little squirrel, or neither was he worried about me. So he would roll those big gray eyes and look at that squirrel. Then he looked back at me. And I thought, well, there's one thing that I can admire in the eagle, that he's not scared. God can't use anything that's afraid. You know, Gideon had to send them all back, was scared. And if you're afraid to testify of your healing before it comes, God can't use you. If you're afraid to tell the people you've received the Holy Ghost... Don't worry, I doubt whether you ever get it or not. See? God wants heroes. He wants something that's brave. God wants something that'll stand up and talk. It's not a scared to tell your boss or anyone else, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, has saved me from a life of sin. So I seen the bravery in the eagle and I thought, well now, what makes him brave? And I looked at him and he, uh, I said, say, fella, do you know I could shoot you? That didn't seem to bother him. He looked over at me, looked back at the pine squirrel. He wasn't bothered a bit. And I thought, well, why, why is he so sure of himself? That's the way I want to be, sure of myself. Know what I'm talking about. All Christians has got a right to do that. You can be when you take God's word. So I thought, what makes you so sure? And I noticed he kept taking those big wings and feeling, you know how they do with their wings, kind of like feeling their feathers, see if they're all in good condition. Oh, someone said to me, Brother Branham, aren't you afraid you'll make a mistake in that discernment? Oh, no. God gave that eagle wings to know that that was what he could get away with. And as long as I can feel the Holy Spirit around me, I'm not scared. But when he goes away from me, I'll get off the platform. But as long as I know that he's there. And the old eagle kept moving his feathers back and forth. And I said, that's it. God gave you two wings and you got confidence in them. You've got confidence to know that before I could reach and get that rifle, you could be in them treetops there and I'd never see you no more. He had confidence. Well, if an eagle has confidence in his wings to get out of danger, God gave him the wings. They're God-given gifts. The chipmunk didn't have no wings, or the ground squirrel, pine squirrel rather. He didn't have wings, but the eagle had wings. The chipmunk was so excited, he was jumping all around. He didn't know what to take place. But the eagle wasn't excited because God gave him something. And if God give eagle wings to get away from danger and can feel that satisfied about it, how much more ought the church of the living God with the baptism of the Holy Ghost around them to get away from danger? I watched them big fella. Finally, he got sick and tired. He knowed I was his buddy. 
But he got sick and tired of that chatter, 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 chatter. You know what he did? He just made one big jump, flopped his wings about twice, and he was up in the, out of the timber. And then he just seemed to know how to set those big wings. He never flopped one more time. But he knew just how to set those wings. Every time an air wave would come in, he'd ride up with it. And then another air wave come in, he'd ride up with it. Never move a feather. He knew just how to set his wings. I watched him until he got smaller, smaller, until he become just a little bitty speck. I raised up my hands and screamed out to God. Oh, that's it, Lord. It isn't flop, flop to this meeting, flop, flop to this church and take your letter from the Methodist to the Baptist. It's just knowing how to set your wings of faith in the power of the Holy Ghost. And when it comes in, ride up with it. He got sick and tired of that little old pine squirrel chirp, chirp at him. And sometimes it makes a Christian sick and tired to hear some of these little old earthbound pine squirrels. Days of miracles just passed. Ain't no such thing as the Holy Ghost. You can't get this. You can't do that. It's all fanaticism. Just set your wings by faith in the Word of God and let the Holy Ghost ride you up. Not jump from place to place, this to that. Just set your wings and ride out of sight. Leave this earthbound chatter, chatter. Days of miracles is past. The Holy Ghost ain't real. Don't you believe that? God's word said it was the, he was the same yesterday, today, and forever. Sail away from it. Out of the troubles. Sure, you believe God's in his universe? Then God in his word. You believe God keeps his word? Every word Jesus said was a seed. Now, you people here in California is very fine orange growers. Now, I don't know whether I should say this or not because I've got lots of friends sitting here from Arizona. But you claim that you have the, the best oranges in the country. Of course, them little borderline patrols out there, they see different of it. But however... When you get a little orange tree, you put a little seed in the ground and it breaks forth into a little tree and you take that little tree at one inch tall and can set it out. Do you know that every orange that you'll ever pick off of that tree is in it right then? Certainly it is. If it isn't, where does it come from? Just think. There's hundreds of bushels of oranges in a little slip about that big of an orange tree. Hundreds of bushels of oranges. Bushels of blossoms. Bushels and bushels of leaves. If it doesn't, where does it come from? Now that little tree is just like you. After you've accepted Christ in the little baby farm, then we are planted together in Christ. Now, the only thing this little tree does, you just have to pour the water to it. And it starts drinking. And when it drinks its allotted potion, it's got to drink more than that. It has to drink so much until it starts pushing out limbs. Then it just keeps on drinking until it pushes out leaves. Then it just keeps on drinking until it pushes out blossoms. Then it just keeps on drinking until it pushes out oranges. It's all the time drinking, drinking drinking and when we become born again servants of God the seed of God planted in our heart we just keep drinking drinking and pushing out everything that you have need of in this earth's journey is in you when you receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost all the healing you ever need all the rejoicing you'll ever need all the power you ever need Everything that you've got need of is in you when you've got Christ in you. But the only thing you have to do is keep drinking. Drinking. The people don't get thirsty enough. The Bible said, blessed are you when you do hunger and thirst after righteousness. When you're thirsty, you can drink. And the more you drink, the 
more you can spread out, the more grace you get, the more power you have, the more faith you have. As you keep drinking from Christ, who is the inexhaustible fountain of life. Drinking the seed farm. God's word is a seed. God is in his word. Look at him when he makes his word manifest. His promises of what he would do. Look at 120 people taking God's word. Went up to the day of Pentecost. And waited until that commission. Tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem until you're endued with power from on high. God's word sunk into their hearts and they waited there. What was they doing? Just sitting around saying, well, I'll see what will happen. You can't water it that way. If you say, well, yes, I believe in divine healing. Oh, sure, it's in the Bible. That's not the way to get healed. You might have the seed, but you got to water it. Now, the Bible said when they were in the upper room, they were blessing and thanking and praising God. What? Praising Him because they knew it was coming, for they had the seed in their heart. God's promise. Tonight, if it can ever settle in your heart, you in the wheelchair, you in the cops, you out there with heart trouble, cancer, you in radio and in hospitals, wherever you may be, if you can receive God's word in your heart and water it with praises and thanks to God for giving it to you, it'll grow into a tree of whatever the seed represents. Healing, salvation, whatever it's for, that tree will blossom. But you've got to drink. You've got to water it, feed it, and let it grow. And the more you trust in God, if you're in a wheelchair and you're in the hospital and you're so paralyzed you can't even move but one finger, just keep moving that one finger to the glory of God. Tomorrow you'll move your hand. The next day you'll move your arm. And you'll be moving on pretty soon if you'll just keep watering it, pushing out, growing, getting bigger and bigger. Take God's word. It's a seed. Certainly it's a seed. God received, gave Abraham a promise as we've been studying. And Abraham let that seed get into his heart, the promise, and kept watering it with praises and thanksgiving to God for the child and waited 25 years. But the tree came forth just the same because he watered it with faith. God is in his universe. All that believed that same man. God is in His Word. Do you believe that? Now, God in His Son. Sure He was. Christ Jesus was God manifested in the flesh. The Bible said that God was in Christ reconciling the world to Himself. The flesh part was man. The Spirit was God. Jesus said, I can do nothing except my Father shows me first. When he was here on earth, he, he hungered like a man. He got hungry. Looked around on a tree to find something to eat. That was the man part. But when he taken those biscuits and two little fishes and fed 5,000 people, that was God doing that. When he went out to the grave of Lazarus, he was weeping. That was the man. That was Jesus. But when he called a man out of the grave that had been dead and buried four days, that was God in his son. Because only God can speak to the dead. God was in his son. It's true. As I said the other night on that little boat, he was a man laying there asleep, tired from preaching and healing the sick. He was a man when he was tired and weary and sleepy till the storm didn't wake him up. But when he put his foot on the braille of the boat and looked up and said, Peace, be still. And the winds and the waves hushed. What could speak to nature but God? He was God when he spoke to the winds and waves. He was a man when the pains and agony of the nails in his hand and the crown on his head of thorns he was a man when he was dying 
But on Easter morning, when he broke the seals and rose again, he proved he was God. He looked like God. He talked like God. He preached like God. He healed like God. And he is God. God manifested in the flesh. The Holy One. Almighty God overshadowed the Virgin Mary, created the blood cell. It brought forth the tabernacle that God lived in. For 33 and a half years, God was in his son. There was a man standing there preaching one day at the beginning of his ministry. They went and got an old fisherman, Andrew. Went and got his brother, brought him up there. And when he came up to this mere man, just a man, Galilean carpenter. But when he come up to him in the face of him, this Galilean carpenter who said, I do nothing until the Father shows me first, looked straight in that man's face and said, Your name is Simon and your father is Jonas. What was that? That was God speaking to his son. God was in his son. That's the reason he said, I do nothing until the Father shows me. When... Philip got converted, went around behind the mountain 15 miles, found Nathaniel under the tree and brought him back. Come up to where a man was preaching. A man, flesh, mortal, blood, flesh, bones, just a man. And as soon as they laid their eyes to one another, Jesus said, Behold an Israelite in whom there's no guile. And he screamed back and said, Rabbi, teacher, how did you know me? You've never seen me. Then from this mortal lips of the man came a word. Before Philip called you, when you were under the tree, I saw you. How could he 15 miles around the mountain? That was God speaking to his son. When the woman at the well came out to get some water and she saw a man, M-A-N, flesh man, sitting over, leaned back against the wall, a Jew, 30 years old, looked 50, said the scripture. You mean to say that you're a man not over 50 years old and you say, you see Abraham, now we know you're crazy. Mad, which means crazy, got a devil. He said, before Abraham was, I am. That wasn't the man speaking because he's only 30 years old. It was God in the man. Certainly was. And that woman looked at him and he said, bring me a drink. That was man. She said, it's not customary. There's a law of segregation. You Jews to we Samaritans. Not custom for you Jews to ask me a woman of Samaria such as that. He said, but if you knew who you were talking to. If you knew who you were talking to, I wonder sometime when we get on our knees if we really know who we were talking to. If you knew who you were talking to, you'd ask me for a drink. And I'd give you water you don't come here to draw. She said, the well's deep and high, you go to draw water. You haven't got nothing to draw with. The conversation went on. That was man speaking. But in a few minutes, something happened. He said, go get your husband and come here. She said, I don't have any husband. He said, that's right. You've got five husbands. And the one that you have now, you have had five and you're living with the sixth one. He's not your husband. So therefore, you said the truth. That startled that woman. Why? She knew that couldn't be a man. She knew he was more than man. Certainly he was more than man. He was God. See this day when they want to make him a prophet. He was a God of the prophets. He was God himself made flesh in a body. His own creation that he built himself a tabernacle holy. And he lived in it. And he walked through it. And he talked through it. And he expressed himself through that body of flesh. That he might by that one body give it as a sacrifice. That he might bring all of us to him as sons and daughters of God. That the Holy Spirit could speak through us and continue his work. God in his son. When he said that, she said, sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. 
We know when the Messiah cometh, he'll tell us these things. See, that was the work of Messiah. What is Messiah? Was the, the Logos, the Spirit of God. Messiah is the Spirit of God, the Christ, the anointed. She said, when that Spirit comes from glory, when it's here on earth manifested, it'll tell us these things. That's the nature of it. That's the nature of God. She said, now you must be a prophet. And we know Messiah cometh will tell us these things. But who are you? He was the only one that ever could. The only one that ever will be able to say it. I'm he that speaks to you. What was that? That was God speaking to his son. She left that water pot and ran into the city and said, come see a man who's told me the things I've ever done. Isn't this the Messiah? You believe God's in his son? God's in his universe. God is in his word. God is in his son. Now is God in his people. What the death of Christ was, was to sanctify a church that he might work through. To continue his work. There had to be an atonement made. And his body, the man, Jesus, was made a sacrifice willingly, like we've taken through this last week. And a type of Isaac willing, submitted himself to death. He didn't have to die. He said, no man takes my life. I'll lay it down. And he did that, that through that sacrifice. That fulfills the scripture. He that's born of God does not commit sin because he can't sin. There's a bloody sacrifice for a man that's in Christ. God don't see your sins. It's covered by the blood. Here some time ago I went into a city where we was holding a great revival. And we'd been, I had to go out in the country. There's thousands and thousands of people in Ohio. Tending the meeting. I had to get outside to get a little rest. We had been eating at a little Dunkard restaurant, nice. And Sunday came along, so the little restaurant closed. And all of them were down, fixed the afternoon service, Brother Baxter and them, and I had to get me a bite to eat before we went down. And I went across to an ordinary, typical little American roadside restaurant. When I walked in that door, it was the most disgraceful sight I ever seen. There stood a policeman with his arm around a woman, and the police was as old as I am. Maybe he married a bunch of children at home and a wife. With his arm around a woman playing a slot machine, which is illegal in Ohio. No wonder we're corrupted. The very laws of our land is corrupted with it. There's nothing sound anymore but Jesus Christ and his word. And you're afraid to take it. That's the only foundation you can lay any hopes upon. My hopes is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood with righteousness. All around my soul gives way. Then he's all my hope and stay. For on Christ the solid rock I stand. All other grounds is sinking sands. All other grounds. Eddie Pruitt wrote that sermon there. That uh, song that they'll sing at the Bekeloy service when the church comes in. Notice. And while this policeman is standing there, I stop. I thought, isn't that strange? I looked over there and there was a young teenage girl, not over 18 years old. A bunch of these hoodlums with their hair hanging down here like women and cut way off in the back and duck tailed there, what you call it. A bunch of little uh, over jackets on, motorcycle riders and everything, standing over there at a table with their arm around that little girl around her legs up on her hips. Another one I couldn't express in a mixed aut- multitude what was going on. And I said, oh, look at there. Look at that. I heard somebody laugh and I looked over to my right and there sat an old woman, old enough to be my grandmother. She is at least 60 years old or maybe more. And she was sitting there with them little bitty clothes on, just shorts or what they call it. And she was, her flesh was so wrinkled till her arms was wrinkled down and she had that, so much of this manicure and what you put on your lips, on ever what that stuff is and all over her eyes like this. And her hair was cut off and painted. She had it. I don't blame a woman from looking her best, but don't look like the devil while you're trying to look your best. Look like a lady, like God made you. And then when she had her hair painted blue, and I thought, oh my, look at that. Two old drunk men sitting there. It's summertime. One of them with a big overcoat on, an old army overcoat, and a, a rag wrapped around his neck for a scarf. And they were so drunk sitting there with this old lady. 
I stood there and I said, God, do you mean that my little Becky and Sarah sitting back there tonight is going to have to come up under such stuff as that? How can you look at such stuff? You're holy. How can you look at it if my heart, just as a minister, burns? I said, why don't you wipe the thing off? How can you do that? Stand and look a holy God. Look at such as that. The old man got up and made some kind of remark. And they two men stuck off to the restroom. I stood there a little bit and I thought, I'll get out of this dump. And I said, I'd rather do it out and try to eat here oh, diseases and everything else and filth. So I turned around, started out, and the Holy Spirit spoke to me. I'll never forget that day. I went in behind the door. I saw a vision of the world turning. I seen around the world a scarlet streak, just the same kind of visions I see here at the platform. And I looked and there sat Jesus. And I seen my sins coming up against him. And I seen a book laying there and had my name on it. And every time I'd do anything wrong, no matter what it was, his blood side act like a bumper on a car. It stopped the wrath of God from hitting me. I seen the tears running down his cheeks, the blood on his face. I looked at it. I thought, oh, Lord, does my sins hurt you like that? And I seen then if he didn't hold them off the very time I committed anything wrong, God would take my life. But the blood of Jesus is holding it off. See, he can't see me as long as there's an offering there for me. When Jesus died, he cleansed all the world of sin, but you have to accept it. You have to accept your pardoning. Or God would destroy the world. The very first sin was committed. God would rock her off of her place. Because he's holy. And his words are right. Before he could even talk to Adam and Eve, he had to make a sin offering there with a lamb. That's the reason that they can have rocks and rolls and all kinds of vulgar in the world tonight. And God doesn't take their life or skip the world off. is because that blood's laying on the mercy seat. But one of these days, that blood's coming off the mercy seat. And then it's judgment. Now, I don't know. It may be off before that clock gets 930. I don't know. Then she'll be dark and there'll be nothing but judgment. You've passed your own judgment, but the attitude you've taken towards his son and the atonement. Now, I see my name there, and I run up to him. I said, Lord, do you mean that my sins has hurt you like that? And I heard him say, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. I said, Lord, if you'll forgive me of my sins, I'll promise to serve you. And he wrote with his hand from his side on that old book, pardon. Throw it back behind him. In the sea of forgetfulness. And I said, I'll always be grateful to you, God. He said, now I forgive your sins freely, but you want to destroy her. Then I come out of the vision and I seen that he is pointing me to that woman. I was freely forgiven. Sin is sin, whether it's little or big. So I said, oh Lord, forgive me. I walked over to where she was. I thought I have to make this right before I leave. I walked her, I said, how do you do? She said, oh, hello. I said, do you mind if I sit down? She said, oh, I got company. I said, sister, I didn't mean it like that. I said, I just want to talk to you a minute. I sat down there and began to tell her. And as I noticed, I was just telling her that black stuff she had on her eyes began to wash down over her face. She was crying. She said, what's your name? You're not that Mr. Branham down here in this. I said, yes, ma'am. She said, I'm ashamed of myself. And she sat down there and told me a story of a father who was an old-fashioned Methodist preacher. Of two girls in the world then. But she told a story of what had been done and bruised her. Many times we see people and we don't know what's behind that story. And then I listened to her. And she said, sir, I once know God. I went to church with my daddy and my mother. But she told me her story, which is very bad and and she got into sin. And she said, there's not a chance for me. I said, do you love him? She said, of course I love him. I said, how could you love him if he didn't love you? There by the hand I took her. And on the middle of that floor there, we had a prayer meeting. 
We broke up the slot machine gang and things like that. And she was led to the Lord Jesus. Why? There was an atonement waiting there to accept her, take her sins away. God is in his people. When he was, they walked with him here on earth for 33 years. God was with his people then. But he told them to wait at the city of Jerusalem. They went up there and barred the windows down because they were afraid. God had been with his people. But then there came on the day of Pentecost a sound like a rushing mighty wind that filled all the house where they were sitting. Then God was in his people. Out through the doors they went into the streets to seal their testimony with their own blood. God was in his people. When old Elijah called on a case where there was the prophet and there was a dead baby, he walked up and down the floor. What was it? A man walking. But all at once he felt the anointing come on him and he stretched himself across the baby and he sneezed seven times and come to life. What was that? God in his people. There was Paul who taken from his, his body aprons and sent them to the sick and afflicted and they were healed. What was that? God in his people. There was Peter the Apostle, not enough education to write his own name, passed down the street, and the people laid in his shadow and was healed. What was it? God in his people. Sure. What is it here night after night when you see the great signs and wonders take place of the supernatural Christ of God manifested in among the people here? What is it? God in his people. Do you believe God's in His universe? God is in His Word? God is in His Son? God is in His people? Now, if He will come to this building tonight and manifest Himself that He is here in the people, won't you remember there's a blood sacrifice under waiting for you? Your sins are under that blood. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, each one of you. If there's them, those here, here are in radio land that has never accepted Him before, Please, at this hour, at the closing of this great meeting at the Angelus Temple, remember, God is right close to your bed out there. God is right close to you sitting there in a the bar room. God is close to you out there and sitting in the car. God is close to you wherever you are. He's no farther away, said the apostle, than your right arm. He's right tacked on to you. He knows every move, every thought of your mind. Just believe him. And let him save you. And do you hear that's in the visible audience? Do you believe God is here? If you've never accepted him before as your personal savior, bow your heads now and let's pray. How many here in this great audience of people visible tonight would raise up your hands and say, I now believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Let him be merciful unto me and pardon me in my sins. Remember me, Brother Branham, in a word of prayer. God bless you out across the audience there. That's right. Raise up your hand. That's God bless you. Back over to my right here on the bottom floor. Anybody raise up your hand. Will you have, do you respect God's mercy to you? Do you respect him enough? To accept his sacrifice and saying, God, be merciful to me. Raise your hand. Somebody up in the balconies, up above me here on the right-hand side. Say, raise up your hand and say, Brother Branham, I'm not living just right. I pray, God, be merciful to me. I've slandered people and made vulgar remarks about them and things. And that's not the spirit of Christ to do that. I want to raise up my hands and say, God, be merciful to me. He forgave you. Put your, sea, your sins in the sea of forgiveness. Back in the balconies over this way. God bless you all along there. That's right. Raising your hands. That's good. Now, God is in his universe. Watch him in the sunset. Watch him in the birds. Watch him in the flowers. Watch him in the winds. Watch him in the trees. Watch him in the morning. Watch him in the noonday. Watch him in the night when he brings out his stars. God's in his universe. We can spend hours on it. God's in His Word. He keeps every word and makes it manifest. God is in His Word. God is in His Son. Certainly. He is the Son of God. God was in Him. Expressing Himself to the world. God is in His people. Watch here. If you want to see God in His people, look around over this audience. All that's born of the Spirit of God knows that you've passed from death unto life. Raise up your hands. Literally thousands of them. Raising their hands, passed from death unto life. 
Because why? God is in his people. How many out here has been healed by divine healing? Knows that God's a healer. Raise up your hand. Radio audience, you ought to see this. Literally thousands with their hands up. What is that? Evidence that God's in his people. God saved him from sin. God healed him from sickness. He was wounded for our transgressions. With his stripes we were healed. How many has passed from gloom and fear and doubt and frustrations into joy, peace, long-suffering, goodness, meekness, gentleness, and patience? Raise your hands in the audience. Literally thousands of them. Out in Radio Land, accept it now. If you don't know Christ as your personal Savior, accept Him now while we pray. Let us bow our heads. Lord, the meeting is almost over. Just a little longer now for the healing service. And we'll close to go yonder to San Jose. God, you've manifested yourself to us. We are sufficiently satisfied that you are God. And that Jesus is your son. And that we are your people. Because our spirit bears record with your spirit that we are sons and daughters of God and have passed from death unto life. There was many that raised their hands here in the visible audience. And Lord, you only know how many out in the invisible audience. Why did they raise their hands? It's because they're needing you, Lord. They raise their hands towards the creator of heavens and earth and ask for pardoning of their sins. Thou hast said in thy word, he that comes to me, I will in no wise cast out. And I know you will receive them. And because they have believed on you. And it is written in the word by the mouth of your son, Jesus, that he spoke this. And all scripture is by inspiration and none of it can fail. He said, he that heareth my word... And believeth on him that sent me has eternal life. And shall never come into condemnation. But hath passed from death unto life. Lord, they're yours. They're the sheep of your pasture now. Lead them by the still waters. And restore their soul with good things. And if they walk through the valley of the shadows of death, they shall fear no evil, for thou art with them. Many hundreds, Lord, no doubt, I'll never get to see or shake their hand. But someday across the river, I'll see them. And we shall speak of this last Sunday night of the closing of this meeting at the Angelus Temple. It was there where they found Jesus as their Savior. The great Holy Spirit hunted them out and singled them out and they raised up their hands all around over the city and, and over the states and out into the sea and on the ships and, and in the islands. They raised their hands to Jesus because they had felt His Spirit strangely speaking to their heart knowing that he will never condemn them, but will give them eternal life. Also, Father, heal the sick and afflicted. It's out there in Radio Land, those that are laying in the beds and those that's got their hands on each other. Just let the Holy Spirit sweep down into every soul and give to them Christ Jesus for every need they have need of. Grant it, Lord, they're yours now. They have come, they've raised their hands, they have received you. And now I've prayed for them and believe that you hear prayer. Henceforth, they are yours, Father. Keep them in peace and give them mercy and healing for their bodies and, and joy for their soul. And may they live in this life and in the next life may we meet together. Grant it, Father, for we ask it in Jesus' name, thy Son. Amen. About the Word of God that just washes you. Oh, let's sing this good old song. I'm sure all of you can sing it now. We're fixing to start the prayer line just in a few moments.
for the sick and the afflicted. I love him. I love him because he first loved me. How many of those that raise your hands? Out in Radio Land, you sing it with us while uh, Billy's coming here to help us, if you will. And let's sing now right to the glory of God. And now we're going to worship. After the hard cutting word of God, now let's worship the Lord. All right, all together. I love him. I love him. I love him. Love me. many Methodists is here tonight raise up your hands the Lord bless the Methodists how many Baptists raise up your hands good look at the Baptists Presbyterians raise up your hands good Lutherans raise up your hands fine that's good while we sing this uh, song again turn right around and you Baptists and Methodists shake hands with one another and Presbyterians and Pentecostals and Nazarenes and Pilgrim Holiness all shake hands with each other now while we sing I love him in this great fellowship. All right. I That's it. Shake one another's hand. Him. I love him. Be oh, radio audience, you should see this. Literally thousands and thousands of people shaking one another's hand. Wonderful. Amen. So kind, so sweet and true. Praise the Lord. How many in the building tonight now in the visible audience that's sick and needy? Raise your hands. Saying, Lord, I need just a little touch from you. We got a little song we used to sing. A little talk with Jesus makes it right, all right. Amen. Many's heard that song and sang it. Now, we can't bring too many to the platform. All through the week. You have noticed when we have no cards give out or so forth, we had a line of discernment. Just let the people out in the audience just start praying. Jesus is a high priest that can be touched by the feeling of our infirmities. And how many has been here to see the Holy Spirit speak and call the people and do the same thing he did in the Bible? Say amen. Our radio audience, you can hear that literally. Hundreds times hundreds of people that's been in the week. How many's never been in one of the meetings before? Let's see your hands all over the building, the visible audience. Tote and fetch and carry, all them kind of grammar. They're too smart to know that I wouldn't be a doctor. I'm, I'm just your brother. I'm just Brother Branham. <laughs> I wish I did have enough education to be. I sure appreciate and I honor the man that has studied to get the degree. But I, I, I'm too illiterate for that and that's the reason i said i was too smart to accept the degree because i know people know better i don't want to as congressman upshaw the late congressman upshaw used to have a a word he says his widow's here somewhere she usually is around in the meeting he used to say you can't be nothing that you hain't <laughs> and that's just about true <laughs> that's right yes sister upshaw i see you back in the audience you can't be nothing that you ain't <laughs> just be yourself People appreciate you more. Now there's a hundred cards of, is that right? What's this letter? S. Each night, each day they give out the cards. Four days in this week we did not give out the cards and just call the line. Now tonight for the healing service we're going to call this 100 cards and start praying for them. I want every person, if you can at the closing of the meeting, give us in the next 15 minutes, will you, 20? And stay for the service. You who are sick and afflicted, just be in prayer. While the prayer line's coming on, your prayers is just as much to do with it as my prayers. The prayer of faith shall save the sick. 
God shall raise them up. Now, out in radio land, you, if the broadcast continues, I thought they might go off the air at 930, but I see the light still burning. So you out in radio land, you pray with us here, and we're praying for you. And we're going to be under expectations to see God in his people. Have you seen him in his universe? Have you seen him in his word? Have you seen him in his son? Have you seen him in his people? Sure. Now he's here. That makes him here. Three is a witness and this is more than three. This is four. Three is a confirmation in the scripture. All right. Now prayer card S number one. S like salvation. Prayer card number one. Would you raise your hands wherever you are? Prayer card number one. Did I see it? Uh, say, are you sure about that number? No. How many's got prayer card S? I hear raise up your hands. Yeah, I guess that there's only, that's all. There's no other prayer cards here but S. Because each night we take up every prayer card in the building. So, prayer card S number one. Look around. It may be somebody deaf can't hear. Maybe somebody in the chair caught can't move. Look for their number. Number one. Could you have it? All right, I'm sorry. Number two, raise your hand. S number two, all right. Number three, all right. four, three, I've never seen that hand. Three, four. Number two, where is number two? If you want to be prayed for, you better answer quickly because we'll call somebody else in the place. All right. S, is it up in the balcony, the people moving up there in the balcony? Is that S number two? Is it down here? Number two, number three, where is number three? Hold up your hand. Number three, there's only two people standing there. And how can it be number three? That's what I'm wondering. Oh, number two and number three. Number four, who has number four? Would y'all raise your hand? Four, number five, five, come ladies, six, seven, good, eight. Now you're doing it. Nine, 10, 11, 12, 13. 14, 15, 16, come right and take your place now. See, the reason we're calling them like this is there won't be pressing over one another and tramping feet. Everything must be done decently and in order in the house of God. Everything must be in divine worship and an attitude of that. How many doesn't have a prayer card and you want Jesus to heal you? Raise your hands. All right. He's just... He's everywhere in his universe, in his word, in his church, in his people, in his son. He's everywhere. All right. As they are getting that lined up, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20. Up to 20. All right. That's fine. All right. They're lining them up. They got the group of the ushers there getting them ready. All right, 20, all right, 21, all right, the lady sitting right back there, 22, is that up in the balcony, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30, that's fine, now while they're getting lined up, Let's sing a chorus, I love him. All right. I love him. I love him. Because he first loved me. And purchased my son. Thirty-two, thirty-three, thirty-four, thirty-five, thirty-six, thirty-seven, thirty-eight, thirty-nine, forty. Let them line up over here to forty. 
Oh, don't you love him? Amen. He's so real, so good. Wonder if we could have a little course down here, sister, down at the cross where my Savior died. Down there for cleansing from sin I cried. There to my heart was his blood applied. Glory to his name. All right. Everyone just remain seated till your numbers call and stay real quiet now because we want you to help us pray for these sick people. All right. Down at the cross where my Savior died. Down where for sin, sing from sin, I cried. There, till my heart was the blood of light. Glory to His name. Glory to His name. Glory to His name. There to my heart was a blood of light. Glory to His name. Now, 40 to 50 stand. They kill us, we're going to die anyhow. So we'll just but die. But if they save us, well, we'll be made alive or kept alive. And God rewarded their faith. Now, you all tonight, in these chairs and things and cots and a dying man laying right here looking at me, he, you're not asked to go to the camp of the enemy. You're expected at the house of the Father with his blessings and his promise that he'll heal, make you well, and bless you. I'm sure he'll do it. And you believe now with all your heart. Now, you in the prayer line that's standing here now to come into the line, if there is any unconfessed sin in your life, remember, I'm laying it right back in your lap, my brother. Look, if you have got sin that you have not confessed, just be it aware that you'll be worse than ever if you come here to be prayed for with unconfessed sin in your life. You make things right. If that's in your life, step out of the line just a minute. Make that right. Come back in the line. But don't come like that. Now, that's the reason my lines used to be when I combed each person closely to see if there was sin in their life by the visions of the Lord. Then the reason I did that was to be sure if God permitted Satan to put a uh, something on the people and not come along with prayer and take it off then I would be in trouble with God and so I I don't want to do that and that's the reason I kept it just one by one and watch closely that nothing passed by now tonight not a discerning line not in the discernment but just to pray so if you've got unconfessed sin in your life don't come in the line before you make it right now then if you have, when you pass by here, don't come by just say, I'm going up and let Brother Branham pray for me. Get that way that's off your mind. The thing to do is know that you're coming to fulfill a promise that God made you. There's going to be thousands of people praying for you. And when you come by this line, when we pray, lay hands on you, just as soon as hands is laid upon you, you've just like rising them up out of the water of being baptized. You have done something that God give you a promise what would happen he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved you go right out of this building testifying that you're saved what if you go out of the building saying well I don't know then you're not saved but God will make your body obey your confession see and he's the high priest of our confession before you can be healed you have to confess it first you have to believe that you are healed and then when you believe you're healed, God makes your body obey your confession. So now when you come by here, just let it be settled. Say, God, this is your command. I believe I'm healed. Walk off the platform. Say, if the Lord Jesus shall reveal to me something about the man, like he did when Philip come to him and went and got Nathaniel, rather. If the Lord Jesus will tell me, now the man may be sick. 
It may be finances. I don't know. I've never seen him. We're just strangers meeting our first time. But if God is in his people and God would be in him to give him faith to believe that, that the Holy Spirit's here to do that. And then the Holy Spirit, by a divine gift that he gave me, to let me just submit myself to him, just commit myself, brother. And he had used my lips to tell this man what he's here about or something about him. And he knows that I do not know. Would it make you all believe? All right. Make you believe too, brother? It I would. Believe. You believe. All right. All right. Now may the Lord grant these things. And if he does, we'll be praising the Lord for it. Now, first time seeing the man, but if the Lord Jesus, the Son of God, who I'm trusting now, will reveal to me what the man is here for, he will have honor and glory to his name. As I'm looking at the man, if the people can see that light between me and the man, that's the picture you find here. It's the Holy Spirit, and there is a woman appearing, which is quite an aged woman. And it's the man's mother, and he sure for prayer for her. That is right. Amen. Do you believe that the Holy Spirit can tell me what your trouble is, or your person's trouble, the loved one that you're praying for? Amen. Her I see it's something with a steer scope. No, it's over the it's a heart trouble. And she isn't here. She lives away from here. She's in a wooded country where there's lots of woods and it's Arkansas. She's from Arkansas. Yes. That's true. That's true. And I see a younger woman. That's your wife. She is here. And she has something like a, a lump in her side. Yes, sir. That's thus saith the Lord. Thank you. you the judge. That true? Yes, sir. Go re you believe now? I believe. You'll find it just the way you have believed. Uh, go and receive it in the name of the Lord Jesus. Uh, be real reverent, believing with all your heart. God in his universe, God. Keeping his word, did he promise it? Say amen. The works that I do shall you also. God in his word, God in his son, God in his people. All right? Just one more. The man's a stranger. I do not know him. God knows him. I don't. He's probably older than I. We were probably born years apart and miles apart. But God knows us both. Do you believe the Lord Jesus could tell me something about you? Now, if I'd say, you're sick, sir, you're going to get well, that'd be all right. That's fine. But yet, you wouldn't know whether I was just guessing at that or not. But if the Holy Spirit will go tell you something that you have been or have done or something you know I know nothing about. And if he knows what has been, he'll certainly know what will be. Is that right? You believe that? Raise your hand now, see? All right. I, we won't take too many of these because it's a weakening. The Son of God, a woman touched his garment, he got weak. And I'm just a servant of Christ. The man, I see him moving. It's something about eating. It's his stomach. He's got stomach trouble. That's right. And it's caused from a nervous condition. You got a nervousness. And you also got something, it's scientists. Up here, you got a bad throat, and you've had a tonsil operation, and it's bad in your throat. That's true. Yeah, you believe? It wouldn't heal up. It wouldn't heal up. Ten months before it started to heal. All right. You believe me to be his servant, the servant of the Lord? Now, if that's right, wave your hand to the people like this so they can see that what was said is true. That's all Do you, true, what he said. You hear that? All true. You say, I maybe guessed at it. Now, just while we're taking our time with this man, let's go back. I don't know what it was, sir, but whatever it is, now you just listen close and see what he says, because it's not me speaking. If I speak and you're trying to say something, I don't mean to be rude, but I can't, I'm just talking, I'm looking, there's something happening, and I've just got to speak. It's not me speaking, it's him. Yes? I see it come back. It, it's something about an operation. Yes, it was in the throat. 
That's right. And the man, uh, there's something about a minister. Oh, you've got a son that's a minister, a preacher's son. That's right. You believe God knows who you are? Could he tell me who you are? Would it help you, Mr. Martin? Yes, that's exactly right. I'll go home and be well. And tell me, dear. All right. God bless you now. Have faith. Do you believe? With all your heart, have faith. Be reverent. Now, please don't move. Don't, don't do that. See, you, you, you just to tear up everything. I'm trying to catch those people in the audience, too. Please just be still just for a minute. Let's have this one more, and then you can, you can go ahead and see. If the, the angel of the Lord said, if you get the people to believe you, and I asked you to do anything, you should do it reverently. See, if you don't, that shows you don't believe it, see. So now, be reverent, just for those who do believe, for this, this one, then we'll start the line right on through. Are we strangers to one another? The Lord knows us both. Do you believe God can reveal to me something about you, your trouble? I was looking, I believe the other two was man, wasn't that right, Billy? And this is a woman, I just so that you can see there's no difference to God. The woman has a nervous condition she's suffering with. And then you've got varicose veins. That's right, isn't it? If that's right, raise up your hand. All right. Now, do you believe out there, all you women and you man, there's something else on the woman. There's something else that's bothering her because I feel her spirit. She wasn't just exactly struck the right thing. That's exactly right. See, there's something else. Let's see. Yes. It's a growth. And the growth's in your nose. That's right, isn't it? You believe God knows you? All right, Miss Ruth Johnson, you can go home now and be well. Amen. That's your name. Who knows that? The same God that knows who Peter was. It wasn't me. I don't know the woman. It's him. Do you believe it? All right. Have faith now, all of you. Just bow your heads and start praying while we lay hands on these people. Dear God, in the name of Jesus, heal the woman. Come now, just start rejoicing. Lord, in the name of Jesus, heal the woman. In the name of Jesus Christ, heal our sister. God, in the name of Jesus Christ, heal our sister. God, heal this little boy. In the name of Jesus, amen. Heal this woman in the name of Jesus. These signs shall follow them that believe. If they lay hands on the sick, they shall recover. In the name of Jesus Christ, heal our sister, Lord. God, as this woman comes walking by, heal her. In the name of Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen. Would you come? In the name of the Lord Jesus, heal this, our sister. Amen. Come, sister. In the name of Jesus Christ, I lay hands up on her while thousands are praying in the name of Jesus. God bless this man and heal him in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus Christ, I lay hands on our sister. Amen. Now, if they laid in the shadow of Peter, it wasn't Peter. How many knows it wasn't that apostle? Say amen. Why, it was God, their faith that he was a servant of God. Christ, heal our brother, Lord. In the name of Jesus Christ, heal our brother. God, in the name of Jesus Christ, heal our brother. Thank you, brother. In the name of Jesus Christ, I pray that you will heal our sister. God, heal this dear old woman as she comes walking by the platform here. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Come, sister dear. In the name of Jesus Christ, heal this our sister, God. Amen. Come, sister. In the name of Jesus Christ, God, I pray that you will heal me. Amen. I'm just as all those people praying out there. Just look at the people praying. What about Radio Land? Come by rejoicing, believing now. In the name of Jesus Christ, Lord, I pray that you will heal her. We just don't know what's fixing to take place, but I do feel that something's fixing to happen. In the name of Jesus Christ, Lord, I pray that you will heal her. In the name of Jesus Christ, Lord, I pray that you are healed. God bless you, brother. In the name of Jesus Christ, heal our brother, Lord. God, in the name of our Lord Jesus, heal, brother. In the name of Jesus Christ, heal our brother, Lord. Come, sister. In the name of Jesus Christ, Lord, heal this, our sister. God, heal my brother. In the name of Jesus Christ. 
In the name of Jesus Christ, heal our sister, Lord. In the name of Jesus Christ, heal this, our sister, Lord. Amen. Amen. God bless you, brother. All right. Come bring the lady on. This lady is blind, looks like way she's staggering along. Lord, be merciful and restore her sight to her as she passes by. May she be like blind Barnabas, pass me not, Jesus. Have mercy in Jesus' name. God bless us, our brethren, and make him. Oh, Lord, I pray that you'll bless our sister and heal her. God, in the name of Jesus Christ, bless our brethren and heal him. With an attitude like that, you've got to be healed. In the name of Jesus Christ, heal our brother. Come, sister dear. In the name of Jesus Christ, heal our sister, Lord. Come, my brother, all faith believing now. In the name of Jesus, may our brother be healed. Amen. In the name of Jesus Christ, heal us, our sister. In the name of Jesus Christ, heal our sister, Lord. In the name of Jesus Christ, I pray that you'll heal this our dear brother. Amen. All right. All right, sir. Come, sister. I want to ask you a question, real reverend. Did Miss McPherson pray for the sick one by one like this, you people at Temple? Is this the way she prayed for them? Yes. It is. Just one by one? I wonder if it's something unusual or something. Now, discernment is something that's come after Mrs. McPherson, you see. The church is near the end now. See? Now, just because I don't stop with each one, I couldn't do it. It would just, I wouldn't be able to get through the prayer line. But he's still here. Amen. The Lord is here. He's here all the time. See? Now, here, for instance, this woman here. Or is this the next woman in line? I don't know you, do I? Jesus Christ knows you. Is that right? Yes. If God will reveal to me what's your trouble, you believe me to be his servant? Yes. All right. You've got nervousness, complications. That's right. Got somebody on your heart you're praying yes, for. Yes. That's the main thing. Yes. It's your son. Yes. And he's an alcoholic. Yes. Not only that, but he's a dope addict. Yes. That's right. You believe that God will heal him? Yes. Then as you have believed, so be it unto you. Amen. In the name of Jesus Christ, may she be healed. Amen. God, in the name of Jesus Christ, heal this our sister. Oh, Lord God, in the name of Jesus Christ, heal this our sister. Father God, in Jesus' name, heal this our sister. O oh Lord, in Jesus' name, heal this Amen. our sister. God, through Jesus Christ's name, heal our sister. O oh Lord, in the name of Jesus Christ, make our sister well. I believe hundreds are praying, hundreds are praying. Just have faith. Come, sister. In the name of Jesus Christ, I lay hands on sister for her healing. In the name of Jesus Christ, I lay hands on my sister for her healing. In the name of Jesus Christ, I lay hands on my sister for her healing. God bless my brother and heal him, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. In the name of Jesus Christ, I pray for the healing of our sister. In the name of Jesus Christ, I pray for the healing of this, our sister. Have faith now. Believe and you start rejoicing, thanking him. It's your attitude. God bless you, brother. I lay my hands and body against this man who's so uh, sick and afflicted. May the Spirit of God give him back his soundness in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. You believe you're going to be well, brother? God bless you. God bless our sister and heal her. Come, sister. In the name of Jesus Christ, may she be healed. Amen. In the name of Jesus Christ, may our sister be healed. In the name of Jesus Christ, may our sister be healed. And I lay hands on her in the name of Jesus Christ for her healing. Upon my sister, I lay hands in the name of Jesus Christ for her healing. God grant the healing of this, our sister, in the name of Jesus Christ. In the name of Jesus Christ, Lord, I lay hands upon her. For it said, they shall lay hands on the sick. In the name of Jesus Christ, I lay hands on my sister for healing. God grant the healing of my sister as I lay hands upon her. May she go from this platform and be well through the power of Jesus Christ. Amen. God bless this, my brother, and heal him in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. God bless this little girl and heal her, Lord, in the name of Jesus Christ. God bless this, our sister, and heal her in the name of Jesus Christ. O Lord God, creator of heavens and earth, bless our sister while thousands are praying in Jesus' name. Amen. Heal our sister, Lord, 
in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. God, heal our sister in the name of Jesus Christ. Likewise to our sister here in the name of Jesus Christ. Bless this little girl, Lord. I pray that you'll heal her in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. God bless you, sister, and heal you in Jesus' name. Bless and heal my sister, Lord, in Jesus' name. Oh, Lord, heal us, our sister, in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. That's it, sister. In the name of Jesus Christ, I pray that you'll heal our sister. God, in Jesus' name, heal our sister. Lord, bless our sister and heal her in Jesus' name. That's the attitude, sister. In the name of Jesus Christ, heal us, our sister. Remember, I cannot heal. Form yourself the right objective, the right attitude. Start right on. It's you the one that's is being prayed for. You're the one that's needing the healing. It's your mental attitude towards God's promise. We can only pray. I know you, sister, so you understand. Oh, Lord God, I pray that you'll heal her. Give her the desire of her heart in Jesus' name. God in heaven, bless this our sister and make her well and heal her in Jesus' name. God, in the name of Jesus Christ, heal this our sister. Father, in Jesus' name, I pray for our sister, you heal her. In the name of Jesus Christ, heal this our sister, Lord. Come, brother. In the name of Jesus Christ, heal this young man, Lord. Amen. Come, sister dear. In the name of Jesus Christ, may God heal you. Come, sister. In the name of Jesus Christ, may God heal you, sister. Come, in the name of Jesus Christ, may God grant your healing, sister, for you, yes. Come, brother. In the name of Jesus Christ, may God heal you, brother. In the name of Jesus Christ, may God heal you, brother. Grant it in Jesus' name. All right. Come, bring the line. Now, when you're coming through, don't be just discouraged. When you come through, reach up and say, thank you, Lord. That's it. Thank you, Lord. Believe it. See, the Holy Spirit's here now. You believe that? How many believes it? Right, that's right. Look out there what's holding on for you. How can you lose? I set real reverent. For I believe that God's fixing to do something. I feel a great anticipation. I'm looking out over this audience and it seems like it's just faith everywhere. Oh, what could happen right now? This would turn to a real night of Pentecost. Amen. Are you the lady? Do you believe me to be God's prophet? You, you are his servant. Sometimes when you say prophet, it stumbles the people. I mean just his servant. I'm a stranger to you. You don't know me. I don't know you. Is that right? If that's right, raise up your hand so that people can see in the radio audience. Thousands are listening to me. We're total strangers. If the Lord God will reveal to me what your trouble is or something about you that you know that I don't know, will it encourage you? It would? All right. How many in the audience would think the same thing? And the rest of the prayer line, would you think the same thing? Believe. All right, sister, look this way. So I can single you from the rest of them that's praying something odd about you. Or you're suffering with a nervousness and a back trouble. That's right. You're, you're not from here. You're from a, you really are a Norwegian. That's right. That's true. Yes, sir. You believe Jesus Christ knows you? You believe he could tell me who you are? If you are Norwegian, you yet believe Jesus could tell me who you are? Your name is Mary Larson. That's right. You believe now? All right, go. As you have believed, so believe. This woman here, I don't know you, do I? We strangers to one another? If God will reveal. It's just, look here, sister. I want you to look at me just a minute. There's 80% of this audience suffering with the same thing you are. You've got a nervous condition. Very, very bad. See? And I just want to show you so that you'll know what I'm talking about. Everyone out there that's got nervous, raise your hands. All over the audience. Now, how could I call that? See, it's just so many of them that I believe God will make you well, Lord. You believe it? Go and may the Lord Jesus bless you. Now, here's a woman that's shattered unto death with a cancer. You believe God will heal you, lady? Everybody out there that's got cancer, stand up on your feet. If you want to be healed at the same time, look out over this audience. Stand here just a minute, lady. Come right back here. I want to pray for you at one time. Come here, sir. 
Stomach trouble. Everybody's got stomach trouble out there. Stand up. Keep standing up. You have cancer and stomach trouble. Stand up. Watch what the Lord's fixing to do. Stand right here, sir. Come right here. Yours is the kidneys back, back here. Everybody's got kidney trouble. Stand up out there. Watch here. Stand right here just a minute. Come. This lady's got a touch of arthritis that's bothering her. All right. All that's got arthritis, don't care what condition it's in, stand up to your feet. All right. That woman's got heart trouble. Stand right over on the side. All has got heart trouble. Stand on your feet and just keep standing. Believe. Come this way, lady. Look here. You believe me to be his prophet? You're anemia. Have anemia. That's good. Everybody's got anemia. Stand up. Anemia condition. Stand up. Stand right over here. All right. Come. Look here, lady. You believe me to be God's prophet? You have uh, a tumor. All right. Stand right over here. Everybody's suffering with tumor. Stand to your feet. Nervousness. All right. Do you believe me to be God's prophet, sir? Yes, sir. You believe me to be his servant? I meant to say his servant. If God can reveal to me your trouble, will you believe with all your heart? You are suffering from a weakness, and a weakness is from an operation. That's right, isn't it? And I'll tell you, something's on your heart. You are seeking the baptism of the Holy Ghost. That's right. That's right. Wave your hand. All it wants the Holy Ghost, stand up on your feet. Amen. Here it is. This is the hour. All you nervous people, stand up now. Every one of you. Look, standing here. While God's healed them, He's going to heal you out there too. Do you believe it? Raise up your hands and praise God for your healing. Oh Lord God, creator of heavens and earth, author of everlasting life, send thy blessings and power upon this church and upon this people. I now, in the name of Jesus Christ, ask that every spirit of doubt will leave the building and Satan will come out of them and they'll be made completely well. Come out of the people, Satan, in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Raise up your hands and praise Him now. You laying there on that stretcher. Get up off the stretcher. Take your cart. Pick up your bed. Take it in yourself and walk on. Go on out of the building. Be made whole. That's right. You can do it. Stand up. That's it. Amen. Stand up, the rest of you. Get the old fellow. Stand up. Get up out of that wheelchair over there. Some of you helping there. This is it, friends. If you want to be healed, raise up your hands now and praise God and give Him glory. Amen.